there comes a point in your life. And I guess for me, it may have come a little bit earlier in my, in my early thirties where it's like, do I see myself doing this for the next 10 years or 15 years or 20 years? And the answer was hell no, there's no way I'm doing this for the next couple decades. So I think that was the moment where I said to myself, something has to change and it has to change now. But I wanted to start off talking to just about like early days that kind of coming out of college and like any money mistakes, how you learned about financial literacy, just dumb things you may have done like when you were in your younger years. <laughs> well, how, how much time do you have? Well, right. let's see. Coming out of college, um, I, I, I remember this, the second or third day out of college, you know, I you know, was living like a college student because I was no money, basically right. spent on nothing just kind of meddled, meddled my way through just like I- anybody else will probably do in, in college. Now it's like, this is my opportunity to be a quote unquote professional work with, you know, highly qualified, smart people making lots of money. I mean, that, that was, that was the anticipation that I had going into the workforce. And I remember the second or third day walking into the office, I, I took an opportunity and I looked around my office building and there was a bunch of, it was a big cube farm. Um, and everyone what was just kind of sitting what was there. Your, what was your first job? It, it was information technology. So we were all computer programmers. Got it. <laughs> and everybody was in their cube. They were, they were, they were meddling away, just typing. And I, I thought to myself, this is it. What yeah, have I done? This is, yeah, exactly. This is what I'm going to be doing for the next 40 years. Mm-hmm. There's absolutely no freaking way I can possibly do this. This is, this is, this is not going to work for me. Now, at that time, I was like 24, 23, 24. So I had no idea about financial independence, about early retirement, about investing strategies and, and, and how to save. I, I had none of that anywhere near worked out. And that All wasn't I discussed was, like growing up, like when you were a kid growing up, was, did your parents teach you about saving, investing, that kind of thing? They did. It? Yeah, they did. But as a kid, I didn't it didn't really make much difference to me. I, my mind was in a whole different space, not really a thing that I was all that worried about. So, um, yes, I had a lot of, there was a potential for me to hit the ground running, but I didn't do that because I just wanted, I don't know. I I really don't know what I wanted at at the time. And I think a lot of young people probably fall into that same boat. They just want to make money and have some fun and go on, go on about their lives. But for me, that that just wasn't going to work in that kind of environment. Slowly over the years, I started to put the pieces in into place slowly, and I do emphasize that. But man, the mistakes that I would make, I basically saved around four percent of my salary, and that was the company match in my four hundred one k. So at least I did that. That was good. That was smart. I got the company match. I got that free money, which everybody should do. If your company provides that as one of their benefits to you, that's literally free money into your long-term retirement account. So I did that, but everything else was basically play money. I can do whatever I want with it. Yes, I budgeted. I had the, I had the rent, I had the gas, I had the food, I had all these categories and I try to be good with where I was spending and control my expenses. But that's just, it just didn't work out that way at all. I would steal from pots that had too much money so I could spend it on things that I just wanted to spend money on. Mm-hmm. I was a big spender. Um, get, I mean, did you get into credit card debt? Was that like, you know, high interest credit that's card one debt? Thing, was that one of the... Yeah, that's one thing I never got into. That was the thing that my parents thankfully drilled into my head, that credit card debt was not an option, period. Right. And to this day, I have not paid a single dime in credit card interest. That's um, awesome. And that definitely helped me. Nice. I wanted to hear about your book, Millionaire Habits. That came out in, when, when did it come out? Like, uh, um, Actually, it came out in January of this year. That's what Millionaire I thought. Habits. Yeah, January. Yes. I was going to say. Mm-hmm. So I want to hear about the process of writing it. What What was the impetus for the book? And- and then we're going to go into the actual content of it. 
strange thing is I never really wanted to write one. <laughs> I never considered myself an author. I never really wanted to be an author, but Wiley reached out to me, my, my publisher for this book. And they, I, they just made it wor- worth my, my while. So I did. And it was the, I've, I've heard two different extremes with writing a book from other authors. It's either the best thing they've, they've ever done. They would do it again, 10 times over, or it was, one of the most grueling processes they've ever gone through. The editing is hell. It, it takes forever. And it was just awful. So for me, it was more toward the first part. It was, it was actually way more enjoyable than I thought it was going to be. Mm-hmm. Very informal writing process. I opened up Google Docs and just started writing. It was, that, it, was, it was really that easy. The publisher didn't really help me outline the book or like pick out topics that I should that, that, that I should hit on nothing. They just said, it's yours, write it, write whatever you want. And so I did. And it was more or less my entire process of everything that I've learned, both me going through the process of becoming a millionaire and achieving financial independence and what I've seen other millionaires do in their lives and the habits that we all share the things that we all do day in and day out to not only become millionaires, but more importantly, stay millionaires. So That's these the habits thing. I combined all into a, yes, yes, exactly. There's, there's, there's 10 chapters each going through each uh, habit of millionaires. And then I also devote another section to the fire movement, the financial independence, retire early movement, which won't be for everybody. Um, but I think, once you get to this point where you, you're, you're fairly comfortable financially, uh, you might be surprised at how close to financial independence you are. But until you know what to look for, until you know the, the Trinity 4% rule, for instance. Yeah. You, but can you explain the 4% rule? You mentioned it and the Trinity study. Go into that a little bit more because yeah. it's an, a really interesting part of financial independence. I think there were four professors at Trinity University, and the goal for this study was to determine how much money you need to have to stand a reasonably good chance of never running out of money for the rest of your life after you quit your job. And so they took data from even including the Great Depression through, I think it was the 80s now. So it's not exactly a new study. And that's one of the major complaints about the Trinity study is it's old data, but they took such a wide variety of, of numbers with the study through decades and decades and decades of market performance, um, that I think it still provides a good baseline today. And what they found was you can spend about 4% of your net worth every single year and stand a reasonably good chance of never running out of money. So to make these calculations easy, if you have a million dollars of net worth, you could spend about 40 grand a year. For some of you, that's going to be like way low. For some, it might be, okay, this this seems pretty reasonable. The other way that you can do that calculation is the amount of money that you do spend in a year, multiply that by 25. Mm -hmm. That's going to be the amount of money that you should have as, as a part of your net worth, all of your investments, your, your savings, that kind of thing. Um, that's what you should have before calling it quits. Right. I found that we can overshoot the 4% rule. I mean, we've been, when we first retired, and I use that term loosely because I'm doing a lot of things now, so, right. but after, exactly, after I quit my job in 2016, we were spending probably three and a half to 4%. So right after we quit, we were, we were spending low because we wanted to make sure that this was going to work. And then once we got a pretty good feeling that, okay, we're, we're going to be fine here. Then we started to tick up the spending, tick up the spending, tick up the spending. And now we're probably spending seven to 8% of our net worth, but we're also earning income. So it gets a little bit more complicated with our situation. We're not putting the Trinity study to, to a test because we're earning income. Um, But for most people, it's still going to be a good baseline. Right. During your process of like working towards financial independence, were you working with a financial planner or was this just you running things on your own, making your own decisions or were you getting outside advice? 
Um, 99% of it just came from me. I never hired a financial planner. Uh, my, my dad gave me s- some advice here and there. He's, a, he was a very, very, very smart guy, or he is a very, very smart guy. Um, very good, good investor. So I was getting some advice from him, but the majority of it was just me just, or my wife and I, once we got married in 2014, just figuring it out, figuring out what, what we had to do to make it work. I'm a very hands-off investor. And I think for the majority of the people out there, you probably should be a passive investor. Passive investors make more money on average than active investors, period. It's Mm -hmm. that simple. And whenever I say that, everybody out there, all the active investors think that they're the exception to that. Oh, I make more. I make more. It's not true. It's just not true over time. There are certain points, like a couple months, a half year, a year, maybe even two years, where you could make more. But if you look over the long term, 20, 30, 40 years, passive index funds, passive ETFs, they are going to be your money makers, and you don't have to think about them. You just invest and let them do what they do best, which is build. Yeah, it's good advice. I want to hear, like, you're sitting at this cubicle doing IT work. When does the, the light bulb moment or what, what was the influence where you were like, I need to get out of here and I need to start quickly <laughs> and start saving and here's the path how to do it? Yeah, it, was, it came many years later. So I mm-hmm. always knew that I couldn't do this for the rest of my life. I just had no plan. But there was once, I think in 2010-ish, when I was around 30, I'd say, um, I walked out into my garage and I reached up to open up the garage door as I normally would, just mindlessly. But something stopped me. I didn't open up the garage. Instead, I turned around and I looked at what was in my garage. So I mm-hmm. had the house in, house in the suburbs. I had a nice two-stall garage. On the left was my brand new Cadillac CTS. On the right was my supercharged Corvette convertible. And in the middle was my Yamaha R1 sport bike. So mm-hmm. I had the toys. I had the cars. I liked going fast. I liked almost killing myself, I guess. I'm surprised I'm still alive today, to be perfectly frank with you. But I think that was the very first um, inkling that something is wrong here. I'm still not satisfied. I have all of these things. I have the house. I have the car. I have the motorcycles. But yet I'm still not satisfied. I still don't see myself you know, spending a life doing this, just earning and spending and earning and spending and earning and spending that that hamster wheel that I was on, I yeah. thought was going to make me happy. And yeah, there were fun times. There's no question about that. Right. But there comes a point in your life. And I guess for me, it may have come a little bit earlier in my, in my early thirties where it's like, do I see myself doing this for the next 10 years or 15 years or 20 years? And the answer was hell no, there's no way I'm doing this for the next couple decades. So I think right. that was the moment where I said to myself, Something has to change and it has to change now. I don't necessarily know what it is yet, but a couple months later, I stumbled on my early retirement mentor. Mm-hmm. And I think we've all heard of this guy, Mr. Money Mustache. Yeah, He yeah. was a software developer. I was a software developer. His situation and my situation were very similar. So right. I started reading his blog figuring out what he was doing and this snowball started to build from there. And over the years, my net worth continued to grow. My savings continued to grow. My spending got less and less. My net worth ballooned. And here I sit. So you're on this hedonic treadmill, basically. You've got all the trappings of success, the cars, the motorcycle, the house, but there's still like obviously something missing. It's almost like at 30, you have this little midlife crisis. You didn't go out and buy more stuff. It doesn't sound like, but it's like a little bit of a crisis. It's like this script that I've been following doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It was, I guess I I bought the stuff before the crisis. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. right. Exactly. Right. But, um, and it, it really got easier once I married my wife, who is a rocket scientist, like an actual rocket scientist. Truly a rocket scientist, right? Exactly. So now we have two incomes. And when you have that, we were dinks, dual income, no kids. And we still don't, still don't have kids. So that's a big advantage 
it's a big for advantage. us in our si- situation because kids for sure. just are expensive. I think it's a quarter million dollars on average to raise a kid right. until 18, something like yeah. that. Yeah. I think that's right. Yeah. It's a lot of money. Yeah. It's, it, it absolutely is. So now we have two incomes, no kids. We have a couple of dogs, but let's face it. They're, they're cheap. They're pretty And yeah. by the end of our careers, we were making a little over 200 grand, 220 grand, I think by the end of our careers. And this was back in 2013 or so. Uh-huh. So that was good money. That was good money now, but that was especially good money then. So we had a decision to make. My my wife and I, we had a decision to make. We could either live like rock stars, buy a vacation home, you know, go out to nice dinners, just basically live the lavish lifestyle because we were, you know, rich, quote unquote rich. Sure. Right. Or we can save and invest the vast majority of our income and quit our full-time jobs and do what we actually want to be doing for the rest of our lives. Long story short, we chose that second option. We saved, we invested, we saved my entire 100% of my paycheck and we lived off of half of my wife's. So I, in a low cost of, cost of living area, that yeah, adds up huge. so, so quickly. So you were into Mr. Money Mustache. Was your wife, who's a rocket scientist, was she also like, these principles make sense. I'm on board. I'm into this also. Or what, what was that like? Believe it or not, no. And she never wanted to, uh, to retire early. She never wanted to quit her job. In fact, she liked her job. So mm-hmm. if it wasn't for me, she'd probably still be, be working right now her, in, in her rocket scientist job. Um, I was the one who hated what I did. I appreciated the income it provided and everything in, in my life now that that job gave me, I certainly mm-hmm. appreciate that. But at the time, you know, getting up in the morning and commuting to an office and going through all that yeah. process of working a full-time job, I did not like that. So for her, it was, if you're going to give me a better option, sure, let's do it. Otherwise, I want to continue working the job that I actually like. Mm-hmm. And for us, it was that option, that that better option was selling basically everything we owned, moving into an Airstream RV and traveling the country full time. And that is ultimately what we did. Our, our, all of our possessions fit into this 200 square foot RV in 2016 after, you know, when we first began to, to travel full time. That was it. That's all we had. Um, and it was, it's not going to be for everybody, but it was definitely an eye-opening experience for us. It's a pretty radical change and you don't come to a decision like that lightly to sell everything, buy an Airstream. I think a lot of people have that dream, you know, that definitely is there, but to actually do it is a whole nother thing. So was it you doing the convincing to her? Like, this is the new life we're going to pursue. And, you know, it's, I'm curious about that because like to actually pull the trigger, difficult to do. Well, it, it was... I was the impetus for sure, but it wasn't me saying, this is what we're going to do. It was, what if we did this? And every single day for years, when back when we lived in a traditional house in a neighborhood, after dinner, every single day, we would walk our dogs and we would talk about this. We would talk about our future, what we wanted our future to look like. And we worked backwards from there. And that's how we got onto the same page about what we wanted to do how we were going to do it, how much money we think it's going to cost. Those things were critical components to figure out before we quit our jobs, you know, those, those, those high income jobs, um, and pursue this, this lifestyle. So together we really reached at that same point. We both like to travel. We still do that to, to this day, not in an Airstream. We travel more traditionally by renting Airbnbs and VRBOs around the world and things like that. Um, but that was one thing that we always just like to do. We all like to travel and see new things. And so instead of like renting an apartment or something or renting houses everywhere we went, it was much more economical, like way more mm-hmm. economical to just sell everything we have, buy an RV, and that's our house. Then right. everywhere we go, we have our house. We have our bed. We have our, our possessions. We had two dogs at the time they came with us, of course. So taking your house with you was ultimately, I think what appealed, uh, to my, to my wife as we were 
discussing what was going to happen and uh, what, what we wanted to see our futures look like. So I want to get into the Airstream life. I, I, there, I've got several friends, you know, back in our 20s or 30s, you know, that would talk about this, like just exactly what you did, you know, and it, it's, uh, I, I, you know, I'm envious in some ways. So I want to hear a little bit about the, the story of like just some, what it was like living in an Airstream for how long? Um, it was three straight years, three years oh. we, we lived in Airstream. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's not going to be for everybody. In fact, I have friends of ours who are, who, who are doing the same thing, not in an Airstream, in a different RV. And it's really not for them. I mean, you, you live it's a really good test. close It's a good spouse. test for a relationship, it, right? <laughs> that's exactly it. That's exactly it. We always say that, that like 10 years of normal relationship living w- with your spouse is worth about 30 years when you're living in an Airstream or, yeah. or an RV, 200 square feet, like you can't, you can't come to the dinner table at the, at the end of the day and ask your spouse. So how was your day? Cause you yeah. know you what their know day what was like. For. Cause you were sitting right next to them or close to right. it. So you kind of have to like your spouse. Luckily you we, my spouse and I like each other. So it wasn't right. re- uh, really a big deal. And, if, and again, we didn't have kids. I do know people with kids who travel full time. A lot of people with kids yeah. who travel yeah. f- travel full time. So it can be done. Don't let that be an excuse. Don't use your kids as an excuse. I say that until I'm blue in the face on, on Twitter and social media. Never use your kids as an excuse. There's always going to be a way to figure it out if you want it bad enough. Um, but you live small. We had very little storage. Things break. I mean, even an Airstream, like the, you know, the more expensive, well-built Airstreams, things break in those two things break all the time. It's only a matter of time until you get stuck on the side of the road with, with a blown tire, which happened at 70 miles an hour. We blew our, uh, the left rear tire in our truck. I mean, it, you just have to be okay with that. Those, the, the things that go wrong. And those, those are things that you don't really hear about when you think about full-time, or, full-time RVing. You think about the amazing places you're going to go and the things that you're going to experience. And all these things are true. That does happen. But there's yeah. also that other side where we have to pack up everything because we're going to move. You know, we got to secure everything. We got to hitch up. We got to drive. And everybody's passing you on, on the left and everybody hates you because you're holding up traffic. You know, those, those are the things that you just don't hear about until you actually get into that situation and you're going through that as a full-time RVer. So I think it's great for a lot of people. It was great for us for, for three years. But even for us, we didn't have to stop. There was nothing that made us stop other, th- other than the fact of us just kind of being over it and said, okay, we want to exactly. spread out a little bit, have our own property. We have seven acres now. Um, we don't want to have to make reservations everywhere we go. Um, so three years was enough for us. So were you getting into, because of your the Mr. Money mustache influence. Were you guys getting into minimalism prior to selling everything? So it was an easier move to have these yeah. kind of reduced living quarters. Yeah. I mean, we so had garage sales, like, like nobody's business. Like by the end, we were just saying, take it like free. Yeah. Everybody's free. Take it, take it. Just please do not leave anything. We just yeah. wanted to get rid of as much stuff as we possibly could, especially as we were getting close to making that transition, selling the house, buying, buying the airstream and moving in. Um, yeah, but we did a lot of things to cut back expenses, like the, you know, cable TV, that's, e- that, that's easy stuff or, or basically never going out to eat, always cooking our own meals, tracking right. our expenses meticulously. There was a time where my wife can tell you how much we spent on sweet potatoes over the year, like each and everything we bought, you definitely don't have to go to that, yeah, you don't that, need to go, that right. extreme. Don't think you have to do that. Do not think that. But my wife's a rocket scientist. She loves spreadsheets. She loves numbers. So guess what? That's what made her feel comfortable. So I said, go for it, man. Go. It's all good. I mean, the more data, the better. You don't yeah. have to have that much. But anyway, tracking your, your expenses was absolutely critical for us. For the budgeting and tracking expenses, do you have something you, you recommend? We always use personal capital as like the high level, like net worth kind of thing. But we just use a spreadsheet. There are okay. a- applications that, that yeah, make it a- easy. Right. Um, like a lot of them now, yeah, but back lot. then, especially there was mint back then. There was mint. Um, right. I'm sure that there were others, I mean, personal capital, but that's not really a budgeting application. Uh, but yeah. yeah, it was basically all Google 
sheets. Right. That's it. Right. Back to the Airstream. I mean, those they're so such iconic uh, vehicles. You know, I see them on the highway, and I'm like, I yep. wonder what those where they're headed. Someplace cool, I bet. So, did you Probably guys just stay in the U so. in the U.S. and like visit all the national parks and all that? Like, what was your travel itinerary? I, I love to travel, so I want to hear. Yep, we stayed 100 percent in the U.S. with the Airstream, everywhere from um, the Columbia River Gorge. Mm-hmm. Washington state, Oregon, yep. uh, border yep. down to Arizona, of course, where, where we are, uh, over to Alabama, then up to the finger lakes, Michigan. I mean, we didn't hit every single national park. That wasn't really w- w- uh, one of our goals. Right. If there was one near, we would obviously go to it, but we just wanted to try, try new places, try new things, see, see the sites, see what's there. Didn't really have a big old itinerary necessarily. Um, I wanted to be around internet. Yeah. That was the major sticking point with a lot of these campgrounds or, and and boondocking sites. Yeah, we boondocked a lot. What which does that means mean? Boondocking. It's free. It's government owned property. BLM that you BLM, BLM land, BLM land is government owned property Got that it. you could stay on usually for about fourteen days. Usually, and then they boot you, and then you kind of have to go. Um, there might. If nobody checks up on you, maybe you could say longer. We never really pushed our luck af- after 14 days. We were ready to move on anyway, so yeah. so we moved on. We definitely liked the, the West Coast mm-hmm. more than the East Coast. I mean, there was like no comparison. West Coast right. was w- way fewer people. It's way more beautiful, at least in, in, in our opinion. Yeah. There are way more places to boondock because there, mm-hmm. there were fewer people. There was more open land. So we spent the majority of our time in the Western half of the U S like Colorado West. Yep. Yeah. Um, we did take one year and travel the East, like Alabama, Virginia, Tennessee, New York, and then back over through, uh, the upper peninsula, like, uh, Lake Superior was amazing. I would yeah. love to, to live Beautiful on Lake there. Superior or not live, but yeah. have a house there. But, um, yeah, the West was our jam absolutely beautiful country out here. So you're three years in the Airstream. At some point you're like, okay, you're ready for the next chapter. Tell me about that. Tell me about what happened next. You, you decide to buy some land and outside of Tucson. What if in 2024, you got a little bit better every day? When you're learning a new language with Babbel, that's exactly what you're doing. And if Babbel can help you start speaking a new language in just three weeks, Imagine what you could do in a full year. Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are designed by over 150 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. Babbel's tips and tools are approachable, accessible, rooted in real-life situations, and delivered with conversation-based teaching so you're ready to practice what you've learned in the real world. Thanks to Babbel, I can start having conversations and order my food in Spanish at local restaurants when the situation allows. It's no wonder they've sold over 10 million subscriptions and that studies from Yale, Michigan State University, and others continue to prove that Babbel is better. Here's a special limited time deal for our listeners. Right now, get 55% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at babbel.com slash WSB. Get 55% off at babbel.com slash WSB. That's spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash W-S-B. Rules and restrictions may apply. Yeah, originally I wanted a bigger office because I was doing a lot online, a lot of writing. Um, So I wanted a more, I don't know, conducive office. I I was tired of sharing my office with the kitchen. And that's what I was doing in the Airstream. So at first we were like, well, what if we just changed our V's? We went with a toy hauler, which means the back folds down. You can drive up an ATV or something back there and haul toys with you. That's why they call them toy haulers. But I can convert that back space into my own office. So we looked around at these options and there were some good ones, but most RVs just aren't really well made for full-time living. Even the, even the expensive ones, 100, 120, 150 grand Mm -hmm. for some of these, you could push on the walls and the walls bend. Flimsy. It's like, what what, what the hell are we paying for here? Yeah, exactly. So then we said, okay, well, this probably isn't going to work because the walls in our Airstream don't bend. Um, right. But we, we had a friend of ours who lived 
here in Southern Arizona. We went to visit him in our, in our Airstream. We brought the Airstream on all the way down and we got a feel for what it's like here and the land values, the, you know, the price of land, how much space you get. And it's like, this, this is, this might be a good option for us. Mm-hmm. Let's get some land. Let's park the Airstream here and let's kind of build out from there. Then it's, then it morphed into, well, that still doesn't solve my office problem. What if we find a small house or we build a small house on, on our property so we can build it exactly the way we, we want it? Travel some of the year, don't travel some of the year. So maybe six months here, six months travel. We ended up buying the price, the, 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 the place here in Southern Arizona. And it's like, we really don't want to travel anymore. We kind of like it here. We like being stationary and having our own yeah. things and having room to spread out. So last year we ended up selling the Airstream. So we no longer have an RV at all. And this is our full-time off, this is an off-grid place. And our Airstream had solar. So that kind of got our, our, that got our juices flowing in terms of keeping our expenses down, but yet still having that stationary place. So 100% off-grid, well on-site, septic system. It is a complete recession-proof house and property we have here in, in, in Southern Arizona, which is great. When you bought the property, was the house already there or did you guys, did you, was it something that you guys built? The house was here. Um, we since converted the garage into part of our indoor living space. In fact, where I'm talking to you right now was originally the garage. It wasn't finished, just concrete on the floor, cinder block walls. Um, yeah. but we, converted that. So it went from a 640 square foot house. So still pretty small for housing standards to about 900 square feet or so of, of living space. So still small, but almost four times the size of our, well, a little more than four times the size math is hard of our Airstream. Um, and it works just perfectly for us. Luckily you've got a rocket scientist to help you with the math, right? (laughs) She does the math and I just nod my head. It's like, yeah, Yeah. that, that sounds right. So now you got your working space, you know, it sounds like you got a nice setup um, and you're totally self-sufficient. Sounds like pretty close to self-sufficient. Maybe. Yeah. The only thing we buy is propane. I mean, we have, we, we have a fireplace, a propane fireplace as our heat source. That's it. We have no heat, no air conditioning either, which might surprise some of you knowing we live in Arizona. It does. Um, But you might be surprised at how well EVAP coolers work in the, Uh in the summertime because it's so dry here. But we are thinking about installing a mini split to yeah. provide more of a, a, a more of an AC option in the summertime to uh, to cool us off. But yeah, mini other split, than that, other than the propane, nice. yeah, yeah, exactly. Other than the propane we buy, we are one hundred percent self sufficient. We need nothing but the sun uh, to That's sustain awesome. us here. That's awesome. I want to hear a little bit about your number. Actually, like prior to to selling everything and buying the Airstream. What was the number where you were like, once we hit this, boom, we're out and we can go do these adventures? We, when we, well, when I quit my job in 2016, we had about, we had a little, little over 800,000 in net worth. My wife continued to work for a year because she felt guilty about leaving. (laughs) So when she quit, I didn't have a job then. We officially set sail then. We had eight hundred and seventy thousand dollars in net worth. That's it, eight hundred and seventy thousand. That was our number. I I don't know if we had said we need eight hundred and seventy thousand, but at that point we just felt comfortable that we can do this. Um, I think the key though in making this a reality for us is we bought the airstream and moved into the airstream a year before I quit. Mm-hmm. So we kind of did a shakedown kind of year. We were right, stationary right. most of the time, but we were like, maybe we should try this. Yeah. See if we're going to get on, get on each other's nerves or hate each other's guts by the end of the second week. And if we did, we would go back to our standard, you know, standard lives. Um, but that first year of living small really helped us to, I guess, be comfortable with making this move sooner rather than, than later. I think my right. wife wanted about a million bucks before mm-hmm. we set sail. I certainly yeah. didn't need that much, but I think that first year of living small, living in, in the Airstream really convinced both of us that we could probably do this at less than 900 K and just live really frugally for a while, 
make sure this is going to um, going to work. Make sure we're enjoying the the whole travel and spending only thirty five to forty k a year. Um, right. And luckily for us, it worked out just fine. You got married later in life, and I wanted to hear a little bit about your thoughts on the advantages yeah. of that. I did the same, so I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, there's the person you marry is going to be one of the most consequential decisions that you will ever make. And that's definitely not something that you should rush. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to, I mean, I could have got, gotten married in my twenties, but it just, it just did not feel right. My mm -hmm. parents, however, were high school sweethearts. They got married super young. So sometimes it works. Sometimes sure. you just find the, the right person in your teens, you stay together, you get married and that's, that's great. But for me, and sounds like for you as well, I mean, I was in my late twenties, actually, no, I was in my early thirties when I got married. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Early thirties, man, well, math, math really is hard. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was, it, it was one thing that I was okay with waiting because I knew that finding the right person who could actually deal with this every single day was going to be crucially, crucially important. Um, and it's it's absolutely worth the wait. Yeah, and it can be crippling going through a divorce and it just really is a oh, man. horrible thing to go through financially, emotionally, yep. all the way around. It's pretty rough. So I totally agree. You wanna make sure you nail that decision. Absolutely. And nobody yeah. thinks they're marrying the, the wrong person. Nobody gets married knowing that, that they're gonna get divorced. So everybody thinks, oh yeah, I found the right person now. Everybody thinks that, and it's very, very natural. And, but I think still, still for most people, there's that little nugget in the back of your head. It's like, is this just a good enough relationship for me? Or is this one that I am completely all in? Let's yeah. do this. There's not a chance in the world. This is not going to work. I can't imagine living another day away from this person. Mm -hmm. Those two things are different and very few people are good at going to admit to that. But I think a lot of marriages are just a, oh, I found someone, you know, he or she is cute, handsome, strong, whatever. They, th this can work. We can make this work. And I think that is what, that is why, one of the reasons why the divorce rate is so unbelievably high today. It's like, I think it might be over 50% now, yeah, I think which is, is really devastating. It'll completely destroy your wealth getting divorced, yes. unfortunately. Yeah. My wife is a therapist and s similar to like living in an Airstream, going through COVID, she said with couples together, it was like it, mm -hmm. it, people knew real quick being together during yep. COVID, whether it was going to last or not. And uh, exactly, she saw a lot of people that <laughs> didn't work out being, being together so closely day after day after day. I wanted to hear about your COVID experience. Like you kind of took a bit of a hit with your portfolio, oh <laughs> I wanted to hear how, how you dealt with it. I have a brother who, when COVID hit, he thought it was the end of the world, liquidated everything, never got back in. Bad, Boy, bad that decision. sucks. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> yeah. So I wanted um, to hear how you handled that situation psychologically. In, in the middle of COVID, we were down about 200,000 in our, at, you know, at, at part of our net worth. But I didn't panic. I didn't sell. We didn't do, we did nothing different. We may have cut back a little bit on, on our spending, going out to eat, whatever, but we certainly didn't sell investments. We didn't get all out of the market. We have a long-term horizon here. And COVID was something that, you know, this wasn't like the great depression. This was, this, it was, it was incredibly devastating for, for a lot of sure. people. There's no question about that. Yeah. But it's a temporary blip. Most mm -hmm. bear markets, and that was a hell of a bear market, but most bear markets only last about a year on right. average. So if you can just manage to not lose your, you know what, mm -hmm. for a year, you're probably going to be fine. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened with us. We didn't sell a single share of stock because it was down. In fact, that's the worst time to sell when, right. when you're down. You buy when the market's down, you sell when the market's high. Um, so we certainly did not make that, that mistake. And we are, as, as, of, as of last week, I think we were up about $400,000 since our 
200k collapse right. in um d- during during uh, the height of covid um and uh, until today so it's it almost never pays to time the market to think that you know that everything is going to hell in a handbasket i better sell now almost never works out if you have that long term time horizon yeah. you're going to be just fine you're going to have way less stress yep um and it's it it, it it certainly turned out that way for us had had did you go through like the 2008 great financial crisis like was that something that you had gone yep. through you'd already seen a downturn you've yep. already seen you know this pattern repeat did that help at all would you say like no, going through a previous actually, downturn no it no. i i did go through it but that was um i think 3 years after my first job getting my my first job so that was i was in the acquisition phase at that point so i was 401k roth uh, ira i th- i don't think i had a brokerage account at that point so maybe th- those two were my primary investments um but yeah i just continued to funnel money in i didn't really care um i wasn't an expert with 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 all this and i think that may have helped me to stay in because i didn't think i was an expert i didn't think that i knew what was going to happen I think a lot of smart people out there, smart in investors think that they know they convince themselves that, oh, this is going to happen. And then this is going to happen. And then this is going to happen. So I have to do this. But right. there was none of that with me. I said, I, I admitted to myself, I have no idea what's going to happen. So frankly, I don't care. I have a job making good money. I'm just going to keep the ship sailing in the very same direction. Um, and it worked out so, so well f- uh, for me that I did not panic sell uh, during during either the 2008 recession or the uh, 2020, 2019, 2020 uh, COVID yeah. Yeah. content. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, no, it, I mean, it just shows the importance of just having a long-term time perspective as you're striving for financial independence. One of the arguments or people that say like one of the challenges, I guess, is like, what do you do about health insurance? That's a common, common thing that I hear people say, like, once you leave your W-2, you no longer have health insurance. H- how did you handle that? At first we did a health share. We did Liberty health share. We no longer have Liberty, but for the first couple of years when we were living in the Airstream, we were traveling around and we needed the flexibility of going to any hospital at any time. We didn't want to deal with, you know, out of network doctors. That, that was all, that wasn't going to work for us. Yeah. And the cost was exceptionally high for mm-hmm. a service that we probably wouldn't be able to use anyway. So right. it was stupid for us mm-hmm. to look at traditional healthcare when our lifestyle was going to have us all over the country. So the Liberty Health Share plan worked fine for us. We never actually used it. We never submitted a bill. So, I mean, it worked because we never used it. We still paid, right. paid into it, of course. Um, but since then, and especially since the Affordable Care Act came into came into play, health insurance is still expensive, but sure. it's not exactly this huge thing anymore. We just went on the marketplace, found a high deductible plan that worked for us, right. has an HSA, and we we bought it. It's no big deal. Um, so I think that it used to be a bigger problem than right. it is now. There's even no longer an individual mandate. So mm-hmm. I even spent a couple years without health insurance, which I do not recommend, by the way. Right. I was right. incredibly stupid. That was while I rode my motorcycle. No health insurance. Very, very, very stupid. Right. Um, but for two years, it it luckily it, it, it worked. It panned it, out. Worked fine for me. Yeah, exactly. Right. But definitely do not recommend that. A lot of health plans are are available on the marketplace. For us, since we don't have kids, high deductible plan works for us. It's obviously not going to work that way for everybody, especially if you have a larger family. Um, but I think we pay $500 a month per person. So that's a thousand a month. Still not cheap by any means, but it's not like it was 10 years ago. Um, when you had to pay basically full price with no subsidies, nothing. And if you do qualify for subsidies, and the crazy part about subsidies is it's based on income, yes. not based on net worth. Mm-hmm. So you could have $10 million of net worth and no income, and you qualify for right. lower health insurance because of those subsidies. Right. So that's one for a lot of early retirees, lots of them. That's what they count on. They're right. low income, making them qualified for health care subsidies, which drastically reduces 
the cost of their health care to something that's actually affordable. Speaking of income, if you are living off your investments, what's the number as a married, I guess, single person too, that you can sell off and have capital gains and not be taxed on? Isn't there a certain amount that you can, you can sell off X amount of dollars and you're not going to be taxed on capital gains if your income is below a certain amount? Honestly, I don't know those exact numbers either, but yes, yeah. if you do stay below a certain amount, I think it's around, I want to say it's around the 40 K mark, but don't that's what I think that, it is cause, too. Cause I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah. I think as a single um, person, it's around 40. Yeah. Yeah. I believe so. Yeah. And I'll, obviously higher if you're married, but um, right. yeah, if, if you can just stay under that, so you qualify uh, for those subsidies, that's, that makes a huge difference in your healthcare, healthcare bill. No question right. about it. I want to circle back to, to the book and start talking about some of these millionaire habits that like you recommend a young person like develop now. Like I've got teenage kids that I want them to start. Mm -hmm. I'm like the habits you start doing, you know, the habits you form now are going to stay with you. So you better start thinking about forming good ones. Yep. It's questionable whether they are right now, good ones. So (laughs) I'm kind of on them a little bit, but what are some of those habits that you recommend people start developing early? Well, my very first habit that I discuss in the book is millionaires say yes. There's so many opportunities out there. Millionaires say yes. Millionaires go wide and then they go deep. And by, and by that, I mean, they say yes to a lot of their opportunities, get involved, just getting exposure to new things, new ways of doing business, switching companies often, which is what, what I did throughout throughout my career and then really going deep into those areas that work well and then saying no to the areas that didn't not every opportunity is going to work out and that's good that's fine there's no no question about that that some won't work out but many right. will but mm-hmm. the point is you're not going to know what you're good at you're not going to know what you like you're not going to know what you're going to make a lot of money doing unless you just put yourself out there and get involved in everything that you possibly can Meet as many people as you possibly can. Grow your network. And these opportunities are going to start flooding your way. You just have to put that first foot forward, which for a lot of people, me included, quite frankly, is really, really difficult. I'm an introvert by nature. Mm -hmm. So for me, putting myself out there was kind of tough, kind of difficult at the the beginning. Now it's no big deal because I've done it a while. And I know what I'm good at. And more importantly, I know what I suck at. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really unlikely that your first gig is going to be the thing that you're going to do the rest of your life. Exactly. I think that advice of like, throw a bunch at the wall, see what sticks, see what you like, and then run with that. You know, then you can start, yep. like you say, say no to the things that aren't, you're not talented at, or they don't produce the income you want or sure. whatever. What are some other yep. habits too? that you know, some of your favorite ones? Millionaires ask for raises. They never rely on their business to just offer a raise, or they don't just accept the cost of living raise every year. They always ask for what they're worth. And Mm -hmm. to do that, you really need to keep your feelers out there about what's what's available, the other job opportunities that you have and what they're paying. I Mm -hmm. always even you know, switch companies every, every three to four years. And with every switch, I got about a 25% increase in salary, way more than my cost of living raises. And I mean, that's part, negotiating a high salary is a part of the hiring process. So it's very, very, very easy to keep your salary going up if you're okay with moving around a little bit more more often. Um, Another habit is the pillars of investing. And if you're in the the US, those are typically your traditional 401k, which is pre-tax, which means it reduces your taxable income, your Roth IRA, which grows tax-free. So if you expect taxes to increase in the future, and here's a hint, they will, then Roth IRAs are a great option to start investing in. Mm -hmm. Then you go to a um, taxable brokerage account. So after you funnel money into your long-term investments, your 401k and and Roth IRAs for your retirement. Then you open up a, for for example, a Vanguard brokerage account and start funneling money into there. Again, highly recommend index funds and and ETFs. If you're not really sure where to go 
give them a call, Fidelity, Schwab. I mean, all these companies have people that, that you could work with to help you determine what you should be in, investing in. And just start. Make it automatic. Set up bank yeah. transfers every month. That, that's another millionaire habit. So you don't have to remember to fund your retirement accounts and your investments account, investment accounts and your savings. Always, always, always make it automatic without exception. You just set it up once and it just works. Yep. It's a no brainer. Anything else that comes to mind in the habits? And I also wanted to hear like what books maybe influenced you as you were writing the book or provided some of the, uh, you know, source material for the ideas. The best book that I have ever read on personal finance and becoming a millionaire is called The Millionaire Next Door by the late Dr. Thomas oh, yeah. Stanley. That was so influential to me. And that book more or less proves that most millionaires are self-made. Yep. They don't necessarily live on the house on the hill and drive the expensive cars. Mm -hmm. Those are high income earners, not necessarily rich people. There's a very, very big difference between those two. Yep. Read that book. I cannot stress that enough. The numbers are going to be way weird because it was written you know, decades ago. Right. So the salary numbers and the cost of cars and all that, that's going to be just radically different than, than it is today. But the concepts still apply. Mm -hmm. Millionaires don't necessarily spend like millionaires and they yeah. typically don't inherit. It was right. more true in the past that millionaires or a, a lot of rich people inherited their wealth, but that is becoming less and less of a reality today. And there are s more studies than I can count that prove that the vast majority of millionaires are self-made. They don't just luck into right. their, their money. And the reason why they're self-made is because they practice exactly what's in Dr. Thomas Stanley's book. They don't spend money on frivolous crap that just makes them look rich. They save and invest their money so they actually are rich. Yeah, I love Morgan Housel's book, The Psychology of Money. He, he's That's got another good idea one. Of like, forget the Joneses. Like, you don't want to keep up with them. They're drowning in the debt, Joneses probably. are broke. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. So you, you, yeah, you the, like psychology of money too? I absolutely love that whole concept. In fact, yeah. one of the most controversial things I, I think that I believe about personal finance is that a lot of people think that you need a mortgage on your home as long as it's low interest for cash flow, for leverage. People like to throw around the term leverage. It's always about leverage. And I, I do understand that there's, there's truth to that. Like it's better to own than to rent. Better to own than, than to rent. But if you read The Psychology of Money mm -hmm. and m many other books, quite frankly, making the right decision, it's not just about the math. It's about what makes you sleep better at night. Yeah. Yeah. And if it makes you sleep better knowing that you don't have a mortgage, mm -hmm. I don't care if you have a 2% mortgage, pay that sucker off. Your sleep's mm -hmm. important. Your happiness is important. Living a stress-free life is important. So don't make decisions based purely on the math and ignoring the emotional, psychological component of these decisions because you're going to drive yourself crazy. You might have a little more, more money, but quite frankly, who cares? If you're yeah. stressed out, if you're always worried about something or other, then what good is that money doing for you anyway? You're just going, you're, quite frankly, you're probably going to die young if you lead a high stress life because you think you're going to make more money. So there's always two sides to yeah. every single money decision. Period. Always two sides, the math and the psychology. We always hear about the math. We almost never hear about the, the psychology. And that's the thing I love about Morgan's book. He discusses the thing that we never hear about. And that's at least 50% of the whole financial in independence equation. It's the psychology. It's the emotions that go behind, that drive our our decisions with our cash. I'm glad you touched on the mortgage, you know, the whole topic or idea of the mortgage, because I was going to ask you that, but he, he goes into my favorite chapter of the book is the last one where it's called confessions and the psychology of money. 
where it's just like, what's under the hood, you know, here's what I do with my own money. And he mm -hmm. just lays it out like, and he has paid yep. off his home. And he said the psychology, you know, the psychological comfort of that is massive. You know, like knowing that for the rest of his life, he and his family are going to have a place to stay, you know, whatever happens, like, yep. you know, but yeah, traditional financial advice would probably say you need to have a mortgage and, you know, have, have the interest that's, you know. Yeah. I mean, when, when we bought our house, we, we could have taken out a mortgage, but we didn't, we just paid the whole thing off and we've, we haven't had a mortgage in, in years now. Well, right. if you include our Airstream, probably closer to a decade. Um, but yeah, we could have taken out a mortgage, but you either have more cash now or you have more cash flow over the months, which is opportunity costs. You can do more with that cash as opportunities, uh, uh, as you get opportunities with that higher cash flow. Yeah. The, the other side of that, of course, is you have more money to invest. Those investments build over time. You're going to make way, way more money then or now. Um, but the, I think the thing to understand, especially in the mortgage versus rent discussion, mm -hmm. and if you ever read uh, Ramit Sethi's material or li listen to him, he goes into yeah. some depth about renting versus mortgage. Mm -hmm. The mortgage is the least you will spend, the lowest amount of money you will spend on your house mm -hmm. every single month. The least, that is where it begins yes. with fixes, right. improvements, whatever. Yeah. It all goes up from there. Rent is the most you will pay. You know what you're going to pay. Every, right. every, every single month. Exactly. That's the most. That is the very, very top. You're not responsible for anything. I mean, with, within reason, of course. You're not responsible for anything. So that, that, I, that concept or that um, way of thinking, I think, it's a little bit, it makes the decision a little bit less clear cut, I think, than a lot of people think it is because there really are trade-offs. Even if you are, you know, hell-bent on having a mortgage so you have extra money to invest, for a lot of people, it's not going to be quite that simple. I want to hear, like, once you've, you're done with the Airstream, you're at the house, what's an average day like? a lot of people say like, I would get bored, you know, like the boredom thing. And there's a stat I think that you have actually about that early retirees die younger. Talk to me about that. Like why, why is that? It is it. Yeah. Early retirement is associated with an, with an early death. And it's not because you quit your job. It's because you quit your job with nothing else to do. Right. That that's, that's the second part of that statement is the reason why you will die young. If you have no purpose, if you have no reason for, for getting up in the morning, that is going to kill you. Retiring yes. early is not going to kill you. Having no right. purpose will kill you. Right. And I mean, the purpose is going to look different for everybody, of course. But mm -hmm. if you, if early retirement is your thing, is your goal, if that's what you want to do, I implore you <laughs> not to pull the plug on your full-time job until you have your next that the, your, your purpose after your job figured out exactly what you're going to do. It doesn't matter what it is, but you have to have something there. And for me, I really got involved in writing. I do a lot of writing online. I have a, a newsletter called M M Millionaire Habits. I always write for that. I'm very heavily engaged on social media, which I like. I like interacting with people and talking about this stuff. Every single day, I'm excited about that. I get jazzed about that. And right. that's what gets me up every single day. We usually get up about six, work out in, in our home gym here on, on our property about seven o'clock or so, have a post-gym meal. I get involved in writing. I, I write a couple of, of articles, go out for a walk. I get 10 to 12,000 steps a day, um, th then come back, maybe do a little bit more writing. Um, then we have happy hour at four, have dinner, watch some TV. It's, I mean, it's probably does sound boring to a lot of people no, out there. No. If you constantly need the stimulation, it's always something going on. You have to go to concerts and, and you know, w whatever. And if that, that's your thing, that's fine. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that. Yeah. Um, but for us, a living a more simple life with less going on, with less on our calendars. In fact, this podcast was the only thing that was on my calendar today. I love and it. that's such that's such a great thing to be able to wake up and say, I can do whatever I want. It doesn't matter. I feel like 
you know, going for a five mile hike, I'll do it. If I feel like we're, we're riding for an extra hour, I'll do it. It just doesn't matter because you have full control over your life after you achieve that point of financial independence. Yeah. I think it's such a good point too about there's so many people I think that have devoted so much time and energy to their career. And then when that ends, they have no clue who they are, what they like to do. You know, that maybe they've raised a family, but it's like, I think there's like a real loss. It's like, now what? <laughs> you know, like, yeah. So if, if your I job is your only hobby, you have no business retiring early. Right. Right. Yeah. Steve, this has been a lot of fun. I really ap appreciate your time and, and sharing some of these ideas and sure. the millionaire habits. Just, uh, just good stuff. How can people find out about the book, find out more about you, get in touch with you, things like that? Um, find out about the book. You can go to millionairehabits.us, not .com, .us. That is my main website, and the book is linked on the main page. Just, just scroll down about half a page, and you'll see it there. Um, I'm also online on uh, Twitter at Steve on speed. The on speed part came because I drove a Corvette and rode a motorcycle it has nothing to do with drugs. I just right. like to go fast. <laughs> so yeah. that was, that's the significance of, of the on speed part. Um, those are the, are, are the two main areas where you can find me online. Awesome. Is there anything that we didn't touch on that you wanted to talk about here? Or the, the last thing I would say is, Whenever I talk about the concept of FIRE, financial independence, retire early, I want to make the point where these are two completely separate concepts. The financial independence part should be everybody's goal. Every single person, everybody who's listening to this podcast, without fail, I mean every person, financial independence should be your goal, period. No exceptions. Right. Absolutely none. Yeah. The early retirement part definitely won't be for everybody. So if you love your job, continue yeah. working for the rest of your life. Who cares? If you enjoy right. what you're doing, that's all that matters. But the financial independence part gives you options. You might enjoy your job now, but you get a dick for a boss. And guess what? You might not like your job then, but if you are financially independent, guess what you can do? I'm out. See ya. Yeah. And I'll take three months or six months or even a couple years off to figure out what, what you want to do. So yeah. always separate those those two things, the FI part and the RE part. The FI part is for you. I don't care who you are. The RE part may not be, and that is perfectly okay. Yeah. Good place to stop here. Steve, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. You, you got it. I appreciate the opportunity. How do you get started with stock investing? I've put together a course to teach you everything I wish I knew when I first started investing in stocks. Let's start at the beginning and ask what is a stock? Let's zoom on in into what it's actually like to buy a stock. A few options are Charles Schwab, TD Ameritrade, Ally, E-Trade. Fortunately, you won't have to necessarily calculate all of these taxes yourself. I'll outline a few main ones to be aware of throughout your lifetime investing journey. As Warren Buffett says, your best investment is yourself. There's nothing that compares to it. By the end, you'll be savvier about stock investing and personal finance than the vast majority of people. Even if you're not a total beginner, I'm confident you'll get a lot out of the principles and strategies I outline, which we'll build on throughout. A link to the course is available in the description below. See you there. Again, going back to when I was still working a nine to five job and just taking all my extra time and pouring into a side business, uh, you know, what's, what's the downside there? Uh, if it failed and it just didn't work out and, I, and I'm staying at that job, the downside is I still have my salary. So I didn't lose that unless, you know, layoffs or something happened outside my control. But I still have that. The only thing I lost was just, you know, maybe a year of my life that, you know, when I gave up the social things, I didn't give up everything, but I gave up some of it. 